Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching.
your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching.
Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching.
Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching.
your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching.
Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Could I have your attention, please? Could I have your attention? I think we need to get started. The, um, the room seems to be full, so McIntyre must be back in the house, and we welcome him, uh, welcome him home, indeed. Um, my name is David Solomon, and I was here for the first of those uh, conferences uh, 20 years ago, whose uh, anniversary we celebrate. It's a great honor to introduce Alistair McIntyre to this audience for the, this keynote address in the Danicola Center for Ethics and Culture Fall Conference on this special 20th anniversary. I would beg your indulgence if I take a few minutes not only to introduce Professor McIntyre in a conventional manner, but also to reflect briefly about some of the remarkable and wonderful features of the Center for Ethics and Culture Fall Conferences as they have developed in the 20-year history of the Center for Ethics and Culture. Let me begin by reminding those of you who might not know what all the fuss is about tonight, uh, who Alistair McIntyre is. Here's the, uh, here's the boilerplate uh, for the introduction. Alistair McIntyre is a senior research fellow at the Center for Contemporary Aristotelian Studies in Ethics and Politics, KSEP, at London Metropolitan University, and a sen uh, senior distinguished research fellow at Notre Dame's Center for Ethics and Culture. He's the author of 30 books, including the influential quartet of books After Virtue, Whose Justice, Which Rationality, Three Rival Versions of Moral Inquiry, and Dependent Rational Animals. He's also a member of the American Philosophical Society and has served as president of the Eastern Division of the American Philosophical Association. He has taught at Oxford, Princeton, Brandeis, Boston University, Wellesley, Vanderbilt, Duke, and the University of Notre Dame, where he was the John A. O'Brien Senior Research Professor in the Department of Philosophy. His academic career began in 1949 when he published his first scholarly paper in the Downside Review, a journal with which many of you, I'm sure, are familiar. Although he, has re he retired from teaching in 2010, McIntyre remains domiciled at the Notre Dame Center for Ethics and Culture in Geddes Hall, just across campus, where he continues to write and conduct his research, where he is presently writing uh, on his, working on his next book. Now, for the slightly unconventional, I, I want to make some more uh, passing remarks about this special anniversary. And I'd like to remind you briefly of uh, McIntyre's special role in the history of the Fall Conference and the Center for Ethics in Culture uh, completely. It's especially appropriate, I think, that Carter Sneed, the director of the Center for Ethics and Culture, has chosen friendship for the theme of this year's 20th anniversary conference. Friendship has certainly been an important feature of all of the fall conferences that we have organized in the last two decades. Friendship among faculty and students, Catholics and Protestants, lay folks and clergy. And if I can add a personal note, my own personal friendship with Alistair McIntyre that has lasted for just over half a century. Although if I make this introduction too long, our friendship might be significantly shortened. <laughs> Alistair's quite impatient with long and windy introductions, which is one of my specialties, I fear. <laughs> and uh, I have tested his patience with some of my introductions through the years. But to hurry along, I first encountered McIntyre's work in a serious way in the stacks of the University of Texas Library, where I spent a long and engrossing afternoon reading through his remarkable book for the first time, just been published, A Short History of Ethics, just been published in 1967. And I don't exaggerate to say I could not put it down. For any of you who read this in 1967, it was a revolutionary book. I was a graduate student at the time and had read much of McIntyre's earliest published work, including his book on Marxism and Christianity, 
in both of its versions, the first version where McIntyre writes the book from the perspective of Marxist and then from the perspective of a Christian, and then we have the revised edition, which appeared a few years later, where he kind of changes course, but in subtle, subtle ways. <laughs> we, were, we were also uh, familiar with his, uh, all of us, with his well-known anthology uh, Essays in Philosophical Theology, edited by Anthony Flew and McIntyre, the famous Flew and McIntyre volume that most of us cut our teeth on in, uh, in philosophy in the 1960s and uh, 70s. Uh, we all knew about Flew and McIntyre, and McIntyre sort of single-handedly through that book invented uh, the field of philosophy of religion. But short history, utterly transformed my conception of what moral philosophy could be at that time. It was in that book that he, had, that he had written just before he moved from England to the United States that for the first time I had a glimpse of that remarkable and revolutionary tapestry of philosophical history, Aristotelian and Thomistic insight, social scientific analysis, literary imagination, and cultural critique that was to be fully displayed later in the last two decades of the 20th century in his remarkable quartet of works beginning with After Virtue. I do not want to suggest, of course, that the vision that first animated the Center for Ethics and Culture is a straightforward creation of Alistair McIntyre's. First, because, of course, he disagreed with so much of what many of us in the Center were trying to do, since he disagreed with almost everything we, would, we were encountering. But the Center would not have been what it became without McIntyre's creativity, doggedness, and sheer philosophical brilliance. His influence on all of us, students, faculty, and staff, was enormous. The center itself was founded in 1999, and with the generous support of the De Nicola family, it became the De Nicola Center for Ethics and Culture just last year. And with the support of Notre Dame's provost, Nathan Hatch, a distinguished Protestant historian of religion, and the enthusiastic encouragement of Notre Dame's then president, Father Monk Malloy, it opened its doors for its first fall conference 20 years ago this week. Many of us in this room were present at that first conference, including such significant figures in the history of the Center of Ethics and Culture as Father Bill Miss Campbell, Mike Baxter, Stan Hauerwas, Tom Hibbs, just inaugurated last week, as some of you know, as the new president of the University of Dallas in a, uh, in a place where I think he will carry on the tradition at this uh, conference. Others like Michael Garvey, Mary Keyes, Michael Sherwin, Peg Hogan, Tracy Wetlake, Westlake, Margaret Watkins, and others all played a part in these initial conferences. We remember many others, of course, who played major roles in the history of the center who are no longer with us. I think especially of many good friends we much miss. Ralph McInerney, who presented a plenary paper every year from the first conference until his death, Tris Englehart, who carries on his crusade in his posthumous book, After God, which is a must read for all of you. Father Marvin O'Connell, the biographer of Father Soren, Father Richard McCormick, Dennis Moore, and other friends of ours from the past. The first fall conference was put together with a small walking, working party of friends who shared a common set of goals about what such a conference should be. Among these goals were, and I'll just list them briefly, one, first, we wanted the conference to focus on student-faculty interaction. The first conference was instrumental in the founding of the Irish Rover, Notre Dame's very lively student newspaper. We always invited, and this was a kind of a breakthrough for academic conferences, we always invited high school students to present in addition to the large number of undergraduates who always came, and that was a tradition that Carter has carried on. Secondly, many of us were concerned at the time the center was founded, or the, the first conference uh, 
took place at the increasing secularization of the university, especially the secularization of the, uh, uh, the faculty. Third, we shared a commitment to a broadly Aristotelian and Thomistic orientation in philosophy that cr included a strong partiality for a McIntyre-like approach to the complex conflicts endemic to modern culture. Fourth, although there were significant theological disagreements among this group who founded these early conferences, we all were mainly proponents of many of the themes central to the major encyclicals of St. John Paul II, including especially Evangelium Vitae, Fides et Ratio, Centesimus Annus, and Veritati Splendor. Fifth, we all shared a love for many of the themes central to the Catholic literary revival, especially, and, and a love for many of the central figures in that revival, especially G.K. Chesterton, Flannery O'Connor, Robert Hugh ben Benson, my special favorite, and Evelyn Waugh. Sixth, we also hope to recover a sense of both the good and the beautiful, as well as the true. The arts consequently came to be central to the programming of, uh, of, the, of the conferences from the beginning. And finally, in seventh, we all shared an allegiance which we continue to share, and I must say, a, 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 an allegiance to ideals that Carter has brought to the forefront of, the, uh, uh, of all of our concerns. We shared allegiance to a broadly pro-life approach to the human person and to the increasingly common assaults on the disabled in the name of technological quick fixes. And I thank Carter for carrying on this, this part of the, of the center's very important mission. These shared common goals allowed for much disagreement among the architects of the first fall conference and those that followed, but that was what these conferences were supposed to be about, how to talk through these issues in a setting of good fellowship, good food and drink, another tradition that Carter happily uh, carries on and doubles down on, one might say, an intelligent and informed conversation. Our initial working party to explore how to construct an appropriate academic conference for the Center for Ethics and Culture included, among others, as central figures, Father Bill Miss Campbell, Michael Baxter, Michael Garvey, Mary Keyes, Fred Fredozo, Father John Jenkins, and Ralph McInerney. Professor McIntyre was particularly influential on those conversations and saved us from going off the rails on more than one occasion, although I suspect he thought that on several we might have uh, gone off those rails uh, uh, excessively. These conversations took place in the 10th floor of Flanner Hall, where we were headquartered at the time, and were fueled, as I recall, mainly by beer and pizza. Our budget was not of the De Nicola range now when the center uh, <laughs> began. Our first conference in the fall of 2000 was on the theme, appropriately enough, given our interest at the time, the culture of death, and was paid for by an anonymous donor, donor who remains anonymous to this day. Carter, I'm sure, knows his name, but we don't talk about that. He didn't want to be anonymous, and uh, he got this whole uh, machine running and he shared our sense of what such a conference should be. So this is to go on a bit. Alistair McIntyre delivered papers at every one of the 20 fall conferences in the history of the Center for Ethics and Culture. He will keep that streak going by delivering today's keynote address, Is Friendship Possible? Please join me in inviting my friend, Alistair McIntyre, to the podium. This is, for me, an historic occasion. It's the first time I've ever entered a business school. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to do it a second time. <laughs> Fifteen years ago, I published a paper on friendship, which was designed to quarrel with one of Aristotle's central contentions, that it's not possible for bad people to be good friends. 
since I had had for something like 30 years a close friendship with a very bad man indeed, I hasten to tell you he's not in this room. <laughs> uh, I was anxious to explain why such a friendship might be possible. And in so, in so doing, I put in question the framework within which Aristotle understood friendship. But it's taken me 15 years to try to provide what I think is a more adequate framework for thinking about friendship, and that's what I'm attempting to do in this over-ambitious paper. In the first part of this paper, I shall present compelling arguments whose unsettling conclusion is that friendship rightly understood is difficult and often enough impossible, especially under the conditions characteristic of contemporary modernity. In the second part, I shall present as compelling an argument whose conclusion is that friendship is indispensable for human agents, whatever their situation and condition, whatever their time and place. In the third part, I shall try to rethink the conception of a good friendship in order to show that it's only when we find a way of giving due weight to both these arguments that we are able to understand friendship adequately. We recognize what friendship is most vividly when we happen to be in great need of a friend and yet no one is at hand to play the part. Our past friends are, as it happens on this particular occasion, absent or dead or lost through some quarrel. Or perhaps it is that sadly, we have never had any real friends. The kind of situation that I have in mind is one where we find ourselves in some threatening predicament and do not know how to respond. Those with whom we usually talk things over cannot provide what we need, perhaps because it's our relationships with them that have put us in this difficult situation. So what is it that we do need? Someone who cares enough to listen attentively and patiently to what we say, someone who knows us well enough to ask the right questions, someone sympathetic enough to be able to understand how things look from our point of view, someone objective enough to recognize the limitations of our point of view. What is it about ourselves or others that we are failing to recognize or understand? It is in short, someone able to tell us the truth. It's only when we're thus made aware of what it is to meet a good friend that we become able to ask ourselves what kind of person we would have to become if we were to be a good friend to someone else. So where are we to go for an answer to this question? There are many, far too many voices professing to provide answers. But alas, the answers are characteristically unhelpful and misleading. Go, for example, to Cicero, and you will be told that friendship can only be between the good and that the good have to exhibit an astonishing array of virtues. Fides, integritas, equitas, liberalitas. Trustworthiness, integrity, fairness, liberality. A catalogue of virtues in which many of us, if honest, know ourselves to be defective much of the time. Aristotle allows that it's only the perfect type of friendship that requires us to be paragons of goodness. We can, without being good, participate in friendships of mutual utility or of shared pleasure. But even this is or should be depressing for many of us. For what we need on the most important occasions when we need friendships, in the kind of situation that I've just described, are friendships sustained by a good deal more than the possibility of mutual utility or of shared pleasure. Yet for such friendships, so Aristotle tells us, we have to be good in ways and to a degree that once again, if we're honest, many of us know that we're not. Another very different and more recent set of voices tell us how to win friends and influence people. The title of Dale Carnegie's 1936 massively best-selling book with its advice on how to ensure that others are seduced, my word, not Carnegie's, by our friendliness and so persuaded to adopt our point of view, whatever it may be, as their own. 
Carnegie has sent all too many successors in the past 80 years, authors of a variety of recipes for manufacturing friendship. But it is, of course, crucial that genuine friendships can't be manufactured. What can be manufactured is a certain kind of superficial sociability, a sociability which no one of integrity could confuse with friendship, but which in much ordinary speech is so confused, most recently in the corrupt idioms of Facebook. Suppose, however, that one does not allow oneself to be deceived by this rhetoric, how then will one think of the present possibilities of friendship? One notably influential answer was provided by Nietzsche in Human All Too Human. I quote, only reflect to yourself how various are the feelings, how divided the opinions, even among your closest acquaintances. How even the same opinions are of a quite different rank or intensity in the heads of your friends than they are in yours. How manifold are the occasions for misunderstanding, for hostility and rupture. After reflecting on all this, you must tell yourself how uncertain is the ground upon which all our alliances and friendships rest. Nietzsche concludes, yes, there are friends, but it's error and deception regarding yourself that led them to you, and they must have learned how to keep silent in order to remain your friend. So for Nietzsche, friendship as the classical authors understood it, and friendship as I have understood it, are both ruled out. Truthfulness and friendship turn out on his view to be incompatible. We can remain friends, or rather apparent friends with others, only by concealing ourselves. What, if anything, is there to say in reply to Nietzsche? We might try to answer him with a certain kind of example. Consider a current experience of military life in World War II, in Vietnam, in Iraq or Afghanistan. A group of soldiers are regularly sent out on patrol together in dangerous territory. They provide each other with cover, they take risks on behalf of each other. On occasion, they owe their lives to each other. They trust each other. Off duty, they drink and joke. They enjoy each other's company. Occasionally, they talk about their families. Were it not for the army, they would never have met. Yet they've become able to rely on each other, as Nietzsche and his friends relied on no one. Is this, then, a relevant example of friendship? Valuable as such relationships indeed are, the answer has to be no, and this for two reasons. The first is that this kind of relationship is by its nature temporary. It was accident that brought it about, and when their service abroad is over, those soldiers generally never see each other again. So it is with many other such relationships in our social order. We find ourselves collaborating in some difficult project, that requires us to spend time with particular others on whose expertise and goodwill we have to rely. We learn to enjoy their company and we become grateful to them as they become grateful to us. So it may be in the workplace, so it may be with members of teams in various sports or with members of quartets or orchestras. Such relationships are for a time of great importance, but they happen by accident and are temporary. What's more, and this is an additional reason for not accounting them as good friendships, those engaged in such collaboration care for each other only qua collaborator in some particular role. They don't care for each other as she or he is in themselves, apart from whatever role they happen to be playing at any particular time. This alone is sufficient to distinguish such relationships from friendships, even though, as I emphasized earlier, such relationships can be, and characteristically are, of crucial importance in our lives. They include all those relationships in which we care for others, quay parent or child or sibling, quay fellow worker or colleague, quay fellow climber of rock faces, quay fellow singer in choirs, quay fellow actor on the stage, quay fellow member of a surgical team. Given the inescapable importance that such multifarious relationships have in our lives, even though they're not friendships, someone might well ask, who after all needs friends and for what? If there were no such thing as friendship, 
as in their very different ways Dale Carnegie's bad arguments suggest, as Nietzsche's good arguments suggest, and as our example suggests. What, if anything, would be missing from our lives? What is it, after all, that we do need when we need friends? What's distinctive about friendship? So I turn to the second part of the paper. Begin again from a new starting point by asking what it is that as human agents, not as agents filling particular roles, we need from each other. That depends on our being the kind of animal that we are, rational animals who share both a capacity for distinguishing the true from the false and a need to judge truly, a need to have minds informed by an awareness of and an understanding of how things in fact are, a capacity possessed by animals of no other species, no matter how intelligent. Insofar as our minds are not so informed, we're liable to go astray in a variety of ways, to be victims of ignorance, error, deception, and self-deception. We become unable to flourish, and we become unable to recognize that we're unable to flourish. We make bad decisions, or we can hope to avoid bad decision-making only by deliberating in the company of a certain kind of other. Such others have to be perceptive inquirers on those matters with which they and we are concerned in our everyday lives. Such others must not only be scrupulously truthful, they must care enough about us and about our flourishing as human agents to insist on us too being truthful, so that with their help we will become able to correct our mistakes to free ourselves from our illusions. Each of us needs such others if we are to be able to deliberate well and to make good choices. Each of us needs such others if we are to achieve the kind of self-knowledge without which we can't flourish. When we are children and adolescents, those needs are met by our parents, by other older family members and by our teachers. And of course, bad parents and bad teachers are themselves frequent sources of error and illusion. But what happens next in our lives? From adolescence onward, good friends become <coughs> indispensable. Note now that, although friends do indeed provide for each other what each other needs, friendship is not to be thought of in terms of reciprocity, of an exchange of services in which each provides for the other only because, or principally because, that other provides for them. Friendship does not rest upon some calculation of costs and benefits. There are, of course, types of relationship which are to be so characterised, friendships, as Aristotle would have said, of mutual utility. But those are not friendships as I am now identifying them. But what matters about friendships? as I'm now characterising them, is that each friend genuinely cares both for the other and for the good of the other, and finds in this caring a sufficient reason for acting as she or he does. Such friends are therefore concerned, not just that the other be rescued from error and delusion in general terms, but more particularly that the other learn to recognise those errors and delusions to which she or he is peculiarly liable to fall victim. Notice now a perhaps unexpected condition for this to be possible. Such friends, if they are to function well as this kind of friend, must enjoy each other's company and must even enjoy engaging with each other on issues of truth and falsity. We can, it's important to note, enjoy our friends even when we find them exasperating, for otherwise such friendships would too often be burdensome chores, relationships perhaps needed, but certainly not wanted. So although the pleasure taken in them is not by itself the sole motive for engaging in them, they must be accounted among the more enjoyable aspects of life. Utility, pleasure and virtue all find a place in such friendships, and it's crucial that the relationships between these should be of a certain kind, more especially that the shared regard for truthfulness, which is at the core of such friendships, should not be undermined at times when either utility or pleasure would be served if either or both of the friends were to become untruthful. 
yielding to the temptations of the useful lie or the enjoyable lie, kinds of temptation that are, after all, endemic in our culture, where the ability to tell the useful lie or the enjoyable lie is often accounted a virtue. I've been describing how good friends feel and think and act in their everyday exchanges, but they themselves will only rarely, and most probably never, think of their relationship in the way that I am doing. They are responsive to each other and to what matters to each, and that responsiveness has to be in a certain way unreflective. It's good for us to have friends, but it's not good for us to have friends only because we have argued our way to a conclusion that it's good for us to have friends. And it's worse still to have friends only because some theory tells us that it's good for us to have friends. I'm tempted for a moment to entertain the thought that perhaps there are on the one hand those who have and are good friends, and there are on the other those who go to conferences about friendship <laughs> and read papers about friendship. But I shall resist that particular temptation. <laughs> If the arguments advanced in the first part of this paper of any substance, friendships worthy of the name should be very few and far between, especially in modern society. If the arguments advanced in the second of any substance, then our condition as agents without friends would be near intolerable, much worse than it in fact is. How then can we do justice to both sets of arguments and also to our experiences of friendship? We have to begin by reconsidering the human condition in a more general way. And I do so by identifying some key differences between Aquinas's account of how we are and Aristotle's account, on which Aquinas does, of course, draw freely. Nonetheless, there are at least three key differences. The first is the contrast between, on the one hand, Aquinas' recognition of the wide range of ways in which and degrees to which human agents of every kind and class succeed or fail in developing and exercising the virtues and directing themselves towards their final end. And on the other, Aristotle's insistence on the inability of most of humankind, women, non-Greeks, productive workers, slaves, that is essentially you and me, to exemplify the virtuous life. Aristotle's prejudices are, of course, notably at odds with his philosophical claim to have identified the human telos as such and human arete, human virtue as such. By silently ignoring those prejudices, Aquinas rescued Aristotle from a glaring inconsistency, so making it a good deal easier for those of us who are women, who are not Greek, who are productive workers, or who are slaves or the descendants of slaves, to judge Aristotle's philosophical contentions about the human telos and the virtues on their merits. Secondly, Aquinas pays significantly more attention to the condition of those who are less than fully virtuous. While Aristotle and Aquinas agree that no one can have the virtue of phrenesis, of prudence, without having the other moral virtues, Aquinas is clear that individuals may and do vary in which virtues they possess, and in the degree to which they possess them. I quote, if we consider virtue on the part of the subject participating in it, then it can be more or less, either at different times in the same person or in different persons. So a more recognizable portrait of humanity emerges, and one sometimes wonders how many people Aristotle had actually met. <laughs> so a more recognizable portrait of humanity emerges one in which moral education has become the work of a lifetime, and moral failure in this or that respect is a recurrent and characteristic feature of our lives. It matters, of course, that Aquinas writes as a Christian theologian, and therefore as someone for whom their sinfulness is one of the key facts about human beings. But as a philosopher, his characterization of the human condition is informed by an awareness of those same misdirections of desire and will which as theologian he treats as due to sin. Aquinas distinguishes between what he calls perfect and what he calls imperfect virtues. Inclinations that happily coincide in some way or to some degree with the requirements of this or that virtue. Some of us, some of the time, have a natural inclination to act as some particular virtue requires. 
We are by temperament disposed to be perhaps courageous, or as it may be generous, perhaps kind. We didn't need to be educated and disciplined in order to act on some occasions as the courageous, the generous, and the kind act. But just because this is so, we're not reliably virtuous. In difficult situations, we will lack the discipline to act as virtue requires. When we do so act, it's good that we do so, and our natural inclinations may be a starting point for our moral education, but actions issuing from them are not signs of our goodness, of our directedness towards our final end. In making this distinction between perfect and imperfect virtues, Aquinas was developing Aristotle's distinction between moral and natural virtues, but he then put it to uses that Aristotle had never envisaged when he presented a threefold account of the virtues in the disputed question concerning the cardinal virtues. That account gives expression to a third key difference from Aristotle. Aquinas finds it impossible to characterize, let alone to explain, the different ways in which and degrees to which the moral virtues are developed and exercised without finding application for the concept of charity, a concept that unsurprisingly finds no place in Aristotle's thought. As an Aristotelian, Aquinas recognized that human agents by nature and habit undertake a variety of activities and achieve a set of goods prior to and independently of any gift of grace. So he says, human agents by their natural endowment are, I quote, able to do work conducing to a good that is natural to human beings, such as to work in the fields, to eat, to drink, or to have friends and other such things. How far they achieve the relevant goods depends on the extent to which they have acquired the relevant virtues. And it's here that Aquinas, in the discussion of the disputed question on the cardinal virtues, distinguishes three grades, three levels of achievement in the development and exercise of the virtues. At the first level, agents seem to exhibit one or more of the virtues in their actions, at least in part, but this only because either their natural inclinations issue in such actions, or they have developed relevant habits, but only in a limited and partial way. There's no kind of unity to their moral lives, because there is no single end, let alone no final end, towards the achievement of which their actions are directed. The contrast is with agents at a second level, whose actions exhibit, even if to varying degrees, not only the cardinal virtues of justice, temperateness, and courage, but also that of the unifying virtue, prudence, Aristotle's phrenesis. Agents need prudence if they are to judge well what the virtues require on particular occasions, and if they are to direct themselves towards that final end which is theirs by reason of their specific nature. To be prudent is to reason as practical reason requires, and one cannot be prudent without having the other moral virtues, just as one can't have those virtues without being prudent. Yet the end to which agents are directed by prudence is their natural end, and not their final end, which is God. But agents cannot be directed towards God as their final end, unless their actions are informed by charity. So there is a third kind of virtuous life. It's that in which agents are inclined towards the virtues, just because their actions are expressions, not only of nature and habit, but also of grace and charity. Their actions of their everyday lives are directed towards an end beyond that to which prudence directs them. But now three things are important to note. The first is that such agents will in many situations act just as a prudent agent acts. Their lives will be for the most part, perhaps almost always, indistinguishable from those of other just, temperate and courageous agents. Yet secondly, that their actions are informed by charity is possible only because of the supernatural gift of grace. They do not have it to act within them it, sorry, they do not have it to act, they do not have it within them to act as they do, just in virtue of their natural powers and training. And thirdly, this particular gift of grace is not restricted to believing or baptized Christians, and indeed many such Christians evidently lack those virtues in which it finds expression. 
If Aquinas is right, then there is something of crucial importance missing from Aristotle's account of the moral life, and indeed from the accounts advanced by most moral philosophers before and after it. For if Aquinas is right, then there are many agents whose exercise of virtues cannot be accounted for solely by what we know of the development of their habits and the exercise of their natural powers. They act in ways that no human agent could reasonably be expected to act. They act better than they themselves could reasonably be expected to act. Does this mean that we are compelled with Aquinas to give a theological account of their actions? Not necessarily. A distinguished analytical philosopher, a colleague and a friend, once said to me, I quote, I have no religious beliefs whatsoever, but I do believe in grace. What he named by using the word grace in this secular way was just that aspect of the moral life that I've been identifying, those occasions of which agents act with a care for justice or, a gener or generosity or courage that goes beyond anything that can be accounted for by their nature or upbringing. For those who benefit from that justice or courage or generosity, and indeed for those agents themselves, what they are and do on such occasions is a gift, something for which it may seem to be appropriate to feel and to express gratitude, even when it is not in any way clear to them to whom it is that they are grateful. What I now want to suggest is that good friendships are among those aspects of the moral life that I've been identifying as gifts. I do not imply by this that the prior formation of those who become good friends with someone else is unimportant. It generally matters a good deal whether or not they have prepared themselves for friendship, whether or not they are open to friendship, whether or not they take advantage of the opportunity of friendships. Nonetheless, there is always more to good friendships than what each of the friends brings to their relationship. And it's that in the relationship that inclines each friend both to her or his friend's good and to their own good. Put this in another way. We never deserve good friends. Friendships are not prizes awarded to the deserving. We can, of course, always destroy a friendship by acting badly towards a friend, and we will then indeed deserve the failure of that friendship, but the good of friendship lies beyond desert as it lies beyond calculation. So it is with all genuine gifts. I use the word genuine here to distinguish the kind of gift of which I am speaking from those given and received by members of some network of givers and receivers, each of whom calculates that if she or he gives something of such and such worth, she or he will receive something of at least equal value. But what results from such calculation as I suggested earlier, is very different from friendship. Even from those friend relationships sustained by mutual utility that Aristotle characterized as a type of friendship. In the first part of this paper, I presented arguments designed to show that, especially under the conditions of advanced modernity, friendship is difficult, even perhaps impossible to achieve. In the second part, I presented arguments designed to show that good friendships are indispensable if we're to lead worthwhile lives. But in both cases, my arguments presuppose the conception of friendships as achievements, not as gifts. What difference does it make then if we understand friendships as gifts? First, of course, and most obviously, we have to recognize that good friendships can occur where we have no reason to expect them and can flourish in what may appear to be unpropitious and difficult circumstances. We do indeed need to be open to the possibility of friendship, as I remarked earlier, but as I also already noticed, there can be no recipes for transforming friendly relationships into friendships. Friendships are unpredictable. Secondly, and quite as importantly, we have to understand the relationship between friendships and growth in the exercise of the virtues in a new way. It's often the case that friendships provide those who are friends with what they most need with what they cannot find elsewhere if they are to become good or at least significantly better than they were previously. Where Aristotle and Cicero claim that it's only those already good who can become good friends, we have to learn to understand friendship as an occasion 
one kind of prologue to virtue. How so? Good friendships are a means to self-knowledge. Friendships survive and flourish, as I noted earlier, only if each friend can rely on the other's truthfulness. And without the self-knowledge that is one result of such truthfulness, we're all of us apt to become victims of our own self-indulgent fantasies. We imagine ourselves as more engaging than we are, more interesting than we are, more capable than we are. Such fantasies find expression in bad choices. So that if we are to choose well, we need the self-knowledge afforded by friendship. Moreover, it's often in pursuing the common goods of friendship that we discover that we will only achieve those goods if we act more justly, more generously, more temperately, and more courageously than we've hitherto acted. Just as families, when they are in good order, are places of education into the virtues in our earlier lives, so in later life may friendships be. Aristotle held that, and I quote, when human beings are friends, they don't need justice. In so doing, he ignored all those situations in which what one friend values most in another is that other's persistence in justice in difficult circumstances, or that other's willingness to acknowledge that she or he has acted unjustly, whether towards a friend or towards some other, and now must remedy the wrong that she or he inflicted. Every friendship that endures for a considerable length of time undergoes vicissitudes and even moments of crisis, moments that may be occasions for moral growth. Aquinas took due note of a feature of friendship that Aristotle ignored when he observed that, and I quote, when a man has friendship for someone, for his sake he loves all belonging to him, whether children, servants, or related to him in any way. Indeed, so much do we love our friends that for their sake we love all who belong to them, even if they hurt or hate us. That's to say, I can only care for your good if I also care for the good of those others for whom you care. So the bond of friendship is inseparable from other social bonds, sometimes of a highly disagreeable kind. And to act with regard to those bonds may require prudence and justice to a high degree, let alone generosity and patience. Here again, Aquinas corrects Aristotle. Without the gift of friendships, then, our social lives would be very different in a variety of ways. The question arises of whether the extended network that composed those lives could be sustained if we valued our relationships only for their utility or for the intermittent pleasures that they afford. Subtract friendships, and much of life would be too colourless. In saying this, I am not undervaluing the bonds of family life, of the workplace, or of those activities in which we engage in the arts or in sports. But friends, as we keep needing to remind ourselves, care for us as we are, and not just for us as we contribute to this or that activity. To be so cared for gives us, as Aquinas points out, reason to value a variety of other types of relationships. Friendship to understood is therefore something that we have reason to celebrate, but such friendship can also present a threat. To what? to the value that we place on our autonomy as moral agents. Here Kant's view of friendship is very much to the point. In his mature treatment of friendship, in the second part of the Metaphysics of Morals, he defined friendship as, I quote, the union of two persons through equal mutual love and respect. Love attracts, but respect requires us to keep our distance. And it is, I quote again, a great burden to feel oneself tied to the destiny of others and laden with alien responsibility. Moreover, if someone on Kant's view accepts a benefit from another, then there is an end to equality of respect between them, since the one receiving the benefit, I quote, sees himself plainly as a step lower, inasmuch as he is obligated, and yet not reciprocally able to obligate. So the equality required for friendship is destroyed. What Kant's conception of the autonomous moral agent excludes is the possibility of an uncalculating care for the other's good, so that issues of equality and inequality in giving and receiving don't arise. When they do arise, it's a sure sign 
that the relationship in question is not friendship as I've been describing it. It's not friendship as a gift. That kind of friendship had become invisible to Kant, just as it was later on to Nietzsche. And it's not unimportant that Kant, and so notorious an anti-Kantian as Nietzsche, should have this in common. For they, like many others, share a conception of the kind of independence that a self-respecting agent should have, one that excludes openness to friendship as a gift. If friendship is indeed a gift, then, as I've already insisted, we can't manufacture friendship. But as I've also stressed, gifts have to be accepted, and they can't be accepted if we're not open to receiving them. What then is it to be open to friendship? There are two sides to such openness, and both are important. The first is to value a variety of types of relationship, to recognize that some of these are indispensable to our well-being, but not to confuse them with friendship. Some of those types of relationship I've already mentioned, such as the bonding between those in the military, or as firefighters, or as police officers who undertake dangerous tasks together, or that of colleagues in the workplace whose cooperation enables each to succeed through time at coping with changing and difficult circumstances. They include relationships in which each party finds the relationship worthwhile only so long as they do benefit in the short or medium run from sustaining it. And cheerful friendliness is a quality that enables participants in such relationships not only to benefit from them, but also to enjoy them. So there are many genuinely worthwhile relationships which are not friendships. And there are lives from which friendship, as I've characterized it, may indeed be absent. Openness to friendship also requires, as I also noticed earlier, a certain kind of responsiveness to others, an ability to recognize opportunities for friendship when such occur. And this openness is a valuable quality in itself, for it characterizes those whose expectations are not too fixed and narrow, those who are prepared to be surprised, who are prepared to take the risk of being disappointed, those who are open to the thought that they themselves may be in some respect other than they've so far taken themselves to be. And to be open to friendship, even if without friends, is not at all a bad state to be in. Lack of openness to friendship may stem from pride, as Aquinas points out, the kind of pride that finds expression in insistence on having one's own way, whatever others may want, in a tendency to be dismissive of others in ways that fail to give them their due, and in a refusal to learn from others what one needs to learn from. It is indeed pride that makes us too often ungrateful for gifts, even for the gift of friendship. Lack of openness to friendship may also result from intemperate desires. Aristotle, in his discussion of the virtue that he calls particular justice, identifies the character trait at issues in particular injustice as pleonexia, the desire to have more and more than others, greed that finds its expression in competitiveness, competitiveness. And to see others as competitors who have to be defeated is to be incapable of friendship with those others. Yet what above all, sorry, yet what above all else stands in the way of openness to friendship is insincerity. And here my argument comes full circle. What the arguments presented in the opening sections of this essay should have made clear to us is the relationship between the place of friendship in human lives and the place of truth and falsity in those lives. It's because the insincere person fails to acknowledge that place that insincerity precludes friendship. Insincerity is only one form that such failure takes, and it differs significantly from other such forms. It's possible to be insincere without lying or with only occasional lies, what the insincere person may do is to present her or himself as other than she or he is by carefully selecting what she or he says, by suggestion and omission rather than by explicit assertion, by gesture and facial expression, by tone of voice. The insincere person is an actor who is also the author of the script. So the insincere person not only disguises her or himself, but also disguises the fact that she or he is disguising her or himself. An insincere person invites others to respond not to their reality, but to the sometimes impressive fiction that they have constructed. 
so the other is put at a disadvantage. And when the invitation extended to the other is or includes an offer of friendship, what is offered cannot, in fact, be friendship. For one is being invited to care for a fiction, not for a real human being. So there appears a character whom it's crucial to understand if one is to understand friendship, that of the false friend. False friends are often good company. They're able to appeal to those who would otherwise feel isolated. They present themselves as needy, in need of a friend, who will provide and will be grateful for the opportunity to provide. But this self-presentation is a work of art designed to deceive, and the relationships that result are like other exploitative relationships. It's important that the successfully insincere person doesn't only deceive others, but even on occasion, her or himself, taking her or himself to be what she or he has pretended to be. And so insincerity becomes a source of lack of self-knowledge, and so yet in another way, a barrier to openness to friendship. And with this thought, I close. Thank you, Professor. Uh, the question is very concrete. Friendship is a virtue, if I understand Aristotle well. So how could it be a virtue and a gift at the same time? If it's a virtue, the idea is that we have to exercise ourselves on friendship. But we may try to do that and nevertheless never become the, the gift of friendship. There may be a... I don't, I'm not sure how deep the misunderstanding is here. On the view that I'm taking, on the way in which I lose the word, friendship is not the name of a virtue. And indeed, both Aristotle and Aquinas discuss in some detail what virtues one needs to have if one is to be a friend or to have friends. So friendship is not in competition with virtues. The interesting question is, on the one hand, as Aristotle and Aquinas very often discuss what virtues are needed in order to be a friend, and as I've discussed, what virtues may issue from friendship. Does that? No, I have the impression that when they use friendship, they use it as a verb, which no. is complicated. No, 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 I don't think so. I think we're just disagreeing here about the text. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Uh, Paul Blaschko, I'm at the Institute for Advanced Studies. My question is, so if uh, insincerity is at least partly a narrative problem, uh, the <clears throat> inability to tell one's story uh, in an accurate way, um, my question is just to what extent can friendship with an insincere person uh, benefit that person by helping them come to tell their story in a more sincere way? Or is insincerity um, self sort of preserving uh, such that you just get to a point where you can't be friends with an insincere person and you can't help them develop? I think this raises a very interesting point. If we were to develop a lengthy account of insincerity, it would be central. Because the insincere person is not merely, as I been thinking out is not merely somebody who on a particular occasion disguises what they are feeling or thinking or doing, but presents themselves as other than they are, and therefore will present the narrative of their life as other than it is. And here, of course, the, 
two interesting questions arise. The first is how far they themselves are taken in by the story they are telling. And the second is how far in telling the story that they do, they are in fact presenting themselves in ways that they are, the word encouraged isn't nearly strong enough, but let's use it for a moment, they are encouraged to present themselves by the way of life and the social institutions they inhabit. Both these points need to be developed at length, and we can't do that here. But it becomes then very clear that both these ways, insincerity is a very important topic in ethics, particularly in contemporary ethics. Um, Thank you. Yes. Hello. Uh, thank you for your speech. Um, I was wondering, with postmodernity, could that, you identify yourself, please? Oh, uh, Stephen White. I, I'm a programmer at Microsoft, so no one insignificant or no one significant. Um, <laughs> uh, postmodernity introduced irony um, as kind of one of the big tools in its toolbox, and irony seems to me to introduce a large amount of insincerity into kind of the cultural milieu. Do you see any correlation between postmodernity and a, a downfall in friendships? Postmodernity and philosophy? Oh, uh, a, a downfall in friendships or the, the kind of decline of friendships. Again, you raise what's a, a much too large question. And I can only, as it were, <laughs> gesture in the, the direction. People use the expression postmodernity in a lot of ways. And, but one of the things that I would pick out as characteristic of both a certain kind of postmodernity at a, in a literary level or in level of intellectual discussion, but also in daily life, is a difficulty in providing one, a difficulty that people have in finding an identity. And this springs from actual changes in institutions. Um, when people identify themselves in the past, and I'm not talking about the very, very remote past, they identify themselves through their family relationships, and they identify themselves through the place from which they come and the kind of history that they share with other people. Now, if in fact family ties are weakened, and by the way, the chief agent in weakening family ties is not some kind of moral failure, as people keep telling us, but is in fact social and economic mobility. If you don't actually see your family anymore, it's very difficult to have family ties. So, People lose their identity, the identity that they have as a family member, the identity that they have as coming from a particular place, and the identity that they have as having a particular history that they share with certain other sorts of people. And this I've noticed in this change, this loss of identity, um, I, have, I have seen since I first came to Notre Dame, one of the things that I always used to ask students who came to talk about a paper with me or for some other reason, my office hours, would be to ask them where they came from. And when I first did this, and we're talking now about the early 1990s in terms of Notre Dame, people would not only tell me which part of the country they came from, but they would say something about their background and kind of family background and relationships. By the time that I retired, when I asked people where they came from, they weren't quite sure what I was asking. <laughs> uh, they didn't know what sort of answer I, I was looking for. Um, and there was a big change here in the extent to which people were willing to identify themselves in a certain way. Now, once you've lost the older kind of identity, you have a problem about how to present yourself. And you can do this in a very naive way. If you are less naive, you may in fact 
disguise the difficulty by resorting to irony of a certain kind, by turning the answer into a way of continuing the conversation that doesn't involve you. But if we were to pursue these lines of thought, and again, they're worth pursuing, um, we'd be here for rather a long time. Thank you very much. Y yes. Jane Peters from Marquette. Um, I wondered if you thought that a perfect friendship is possible. And I also wondered if you thought that any kind of friendship on social media or even through letters, writing letters, is possible. Thank you. Good. Again, I must say the questioners this afternoon are particularly good at raising subjects that you could have a whole conference about. <laughs> So let me begin with, not with your question about perfect friendship, uh, but with your, what you raised about communication through letters. It's very obvious that for most of, for a very large part of our history, when friends communicated, they did so either by talk, conversation, or by writing letters to each other. And those characteristically would be rather long letters. And letter writing was an art, and people learned how to practice it. Uh, at the same time, conversation is also an art, and people are better or worse at that. So it's very important that the quality of friendships had to do with the quality of conversation letter writing. Now, letter writing has almost disappeared, right? And conversation, we need a lot of talk about that. But one of the, one thing about the great social media, uh, Facebook, Twitter, whatever you like, they are immensely destructive of conversation. Um, and in fact, one of the ways in which you turn yourself off, I mean, you separate yourself, not only from others, but from human history, is by owning a cell phone. Uh, it is uh, something that is great harm. And it's very interesting, the university requires you to have cell phones. Uh, that tells you something about universities. Uh, <laughs> What I would be doing then, if I was pursuing your question further, would be talking about various kinds of imperfection in friendship. And this would lead on to the view that there is no such thing as perfection as such. That some friendships are more perfect in some ways, some in other ways. But the notion of perfection as such doesn't belong to friendship. But that too would need arguing, and I'm not going to argue it here. You. Yes. Hi, uh, thank you so much for your talk. I'm Naomi Ladine, I'm an undergrad at Furman University. And my question is about insincerity and modesty. So I have several friends and one in particular who um, after sharing something that's difficult for her, something that she's struggling with, um, problems she's having, things she's messing up about, um, she'll immediately, after describing it, follow up by saying, but, you know, it's fine, and... Sorry, I, I, I can't actually hear what you're saying. Oh. Can you go slower? Yes. And mm -hmm. um, so I'm asking about insincerity and modesty and thinking about friends who immediately after sharing something that they struggle with follow up by dismissing it and saying, it's not that big of a deal, it's fine, I'm fine, don't worry about me. So, um... I'm, it's sort of like a terror of being a burden on someone else. And so what I'm asking is how would you distinguish between insincerity and modesty? And how would you maybe explain that to people in a way that could show them that um, this sort of false trivializing of their problems isn't actually being virtuous or like s sorting through anything or making anything better? Does that... Does that make sense? Could you hear that? Yeah. Let me just, again, this will really touch the edges of what, what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> if 
where all of us have to be a burden on other people a great deal of the time. And being open to friendship is being open to the possibility that what one has to do is to be good at bearing other people's burdens mm -hmm. on occasion. And here again, it's very important that in realistic friendships, bearing someone else's burdens is perfectly compatible with from time to time saying to them, now please do stop being a bore. <laughs> right? And that to be open to friendship is to know how to respond when that is said to one. <laughs> and to recognize when it's just. I'm very good at boring people. <laughs> That's really as far as I'd want to take it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Zach Mercugliano, University of Notre Dame. So your, uh, your statement about how mutual pursuit or mutual struggle doesn't necessarily breed friendship, such as in a work environment, I was wondering your thoughts on how that translates to students at a university where you are struggling together, but it could be in an intellectual pursuit, or there's typically more multifaceted dynamics going on than just pursuing <laughs> completing some business project? Again, let me only just come in on, the, as it were, the edges of what you're saying. Um, it's very important that when people are students, they perhaps for the first time or very close to the first time find themselves with a group whom they think of as friends. And that these friendships are embodied, as you suggest, in shared activities of a variety of kinds. And that it's in and through sharing activities with other people that we get to know them. And we're very apt to think of ourselves as having a great many friends in certain kinds of contexts of this kind. I, in my paper, have wanted to distinguish between what I called good friendships and what I called friendly relationships. But I recognize that what I call friendly relationships are what people very often call friendships. And there's nothing wrong with that, provided people understand the distinction. What I think some people, what happens to some people is that when they look back on their undergraduate days and the kind of relationships then, they feel that their present life is impoverished in comparison with that life. They regret, they think of this, and they will say to, they will themselves bore young people by saying to them, these are the happiest days of your life, right? <laughs> <laughs> but in fact, what one, as one moves beyond being a student into the various forms of mature adult life, one needs to make a strong, the strong distinction that I made in the paper between friendly relationships, which are immensely important. I'm not trying to deny that at all, and what I've characterized as good friendships. That's where I begin from. Okay, thank you. Professor Butachi. Thank you for the talk. Uh, Jonathan Butachi, Catholic University of America. Um, I have a rather concrete question about your talk, I hope not uninterestingly so, but I, I want to draw our attention back to the three stages that you outlined from Aquinas's disputed questions on the virtues. And if I understand you rightly, you took that to be a rethinking of Aristotle, and you yourself wanted to rethink what Aquinas outlined there, in particular with respect to the third stage. Um, and I, I took you, maybe I misunderstood, to be saying that that third stage was distinguished um, with the supernatural gift of grace, and you wanted to look, well, what does gift as such, how, how does gift as such play, perhaps not supernatural, in the moral development of an agent? Um, and and fr friendship then becomes the occasion. So I think I understood you there. So my question then is, would you, how would you rethink then the three stages in view of this revision, um, not, not just the supernatural gift, but gift 
as such? How would friendship, for example, reshape our understanding of the second stage and the cultivation of phrenesis? Okay. You're raising a question here that I didn't pursue at all in the paper. I used Aquinas' discussion of the relationship between charity and the moral virtues in order to introduce the notion of a gift. That is, to introduce the notion of exercises of the virtues that cannot be accounted for solely on the basis of natural inclination, but also not on the basis of natural inclination plus habitual formation. And someone can have had an excellent moral education and yet on Aquinas' view not have achieved the third grade, whereas somebody can be defective in all sorts of ways and yet grace, supernatural grace, transforms them. Now it's very important that, as I said in the paper, when Aquinas talks about the part that charity plays as the form of all the virtues. He doesn't in the least suggest that therefore charity is exhibited in the lives of believing and baptized Christians, but not in those of others. He thinks that in fact, we find charity exhibited in the world in a variety of ways by people who don't recognize that what they're doing is exhibiting charity. So that introduced the notion of a gift. I take it that friendship is also a gift but then we would have to say a gift of another kind. But it shares many of the characteristics that the exercises of charity have. And this is a question that I'm not going to go further with now. It requires a lot of work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. My, my name is Mark Ryland. I'm from Great Falls, Virginia. Thank you for an excellent paper. Um, the way you're, you treated sincerity at the end was, I think, particularly striking. And even in one of the questions, you pointed out that blunt or extreme truthfulness may not be conducive to friendship. There are things that your friend may not be able to receive that you believe to be true, so there has to be a certain prudence in, involved in that type of exchange. But then that makes me go back to, I guess, the beginning of the paper where it seemed like you focused a lot on truthfulness as a very foundational aspect of friendship. And I guess I'm wondering if that can be, needs to be tempered by this, a, a receptivity of the other person such that truthfulness, while you never are false, there may be a, a more dynamic quality in friendship that involves a certain amount of guarded, guardedness which is based on the receptivity of the, of the friend. I put, I place truthfulness at the very core of things as far as human beings are concerned. I take it to be very important that when Aquinas discusses what is wrong about a lie, he doesn't place the wrongness in the intention, primarily, but in the falsity of what is said. And that he takes it that human beings are defined by their relationship to truth and falsity in a very important way. And this is prior to all other considerations. So it isn't something, it isn't that this is something I would balance against other considerations. I can bring this out in the following way. And this is the way in which I have introduced this to students in the past. We all of us are all the time answering the question, what kind of goods should I admit into my life? What would be the best way for me to live? And this can involve apparently trivial and unimportant choices, relatively minor things, or it may be major things like should I participate in choral singing? Should I take a strong interest in politics? All sorts of things. Which are the goods that I'm going to pursue? Now I take it that in order to be able to answer these questions, we need to deliberate with others. If we try to answer these, by our, these questions by ourselves, we will be victims of our own one-sidedness and our own capacity for self-deception in a variety of ways. And therefore, we need to have a relationship with others. We deliberate together with them. And then what, is, what are the bonds that we have with those others? And the answer is, those others must be able to expect 
truthfulness from us, and we must be able to expect truthfulness from them. They must know that we are not trying to bully them or charm them or seduce them. We are trying to argue with them as to how it would be best for us to live and for them to live. And that since truthfulness is a precondition of good rational deliberation and choice making, and since those determine the shape of our lives, truthfulness is, so to speak, one of, it's not the only one, but the norm of truthfulness, if it, that doesn't inform our relationships, then we are lost. And this is what underpins what I would say about relationships in general. But of course, it has a characteristically important place in friendships. That perhaps is a good place to which to stop. Sure. Yes. I, 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 I think we should probably keep that, Professor Maxwell, I think uh, for a long time, but I think you've splendid uh, 